All right, good evening. Thank you again for participating in this virtual meeting for the ACE Series to Merced Extension Project Draft Environmental Impact Report, or EIR. My name is Tiffany Mendoza, and I'm part of the consultant team supporting the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission with the project's environmental review process. Today's meeting will include a presentation followed by a question and answer session to respond to your questions. Questions should be entered using the Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar. The Q&A icon shown on this slide appears at the bottom of your screen if you're using a laptop or desktop computer. Or if you're joining via a tablet or a mobile device, you may see the Q&A icon at the top of the screen. Clicking on that icon will open a box that you can type your questions into. While we will not be accepting verbal comments or questions during this meeting, attendees who have joined by phone only and are unable to type in a question can contact Leo Mena, who will submit a question on your behalf. Leo can also be contacted for project information in Spanish, and Leo can be reached at 415-677-7170. This information will be provided again at the end of the presentation, and all questions will be held until the end of the presentation. Please also note that questions asked during this webinar are not considered official comments on the draft EIR. Comments should be submitted in writing, and we will provide additional details on that later in the presentation. And before we get started, I wanted to share a few quick meeting tips. We're conducting this meeting using Zoom webinar. Your individual internet connections may impact your experience using Zoom, so we recommend closing all apps and programs and limiting streaming or downloads during this meeting. If you experience connection, connection issues during this meeting, it can also be accessed by phone, and the telephone number is located on the project's website, and it is 877-853 5247. The meeting ID is 864-3069-8124. And the meeting password is 86342732. The agenda for tonight's meeting will begin with introductions from the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission. Then the presentation will provide an overview of the proposed ACE extension to Merced, a description of the project elements, and information about the environmental review process and the findings of the draft EIR. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will read and respond to your questions. Now I'd like to introduce Dan Levitt, the Manager of Regional Initiatives with the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission. Good evening. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So welcome, and we, we really appreciate your attendance tonight. Um, I do represent the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission. We are the owner operator of the ACE Rail Service, and uh, we really appreciate your valuable time tonight. Public outreach is an important part of the environmental review process. Key goals for tonight, that the primary purpose of this meeting is, is really to, to be able to go over the key findings of the draft environmental document with you. We also wanna make sure that you do have information to know um, how and, and, and where and when to, to make formal comments on the document. As, as well at the end, uh, Tiffany mentioned, we will have question and answers at the end of this presentation. While that's informal, um, we hope that it'll help you formulate potential comments that you might make formally later. Next slide. The team that we have uh, here tonight, I want to introduce to you, and this is myself, and I am manager of regional initiatives. From the Rail Commission, we also have David Ruperta, who's senior planner with the Rail Commission. Both David and I have been assisting Kevin Sheridan, our director of capital projects, on the management of this effort. On our consulting team, we have our project manager from the AECOM team, uh, Daniel Kraus, uh, Daniel Hartman, his lead engineer for AECOM. And then from ICF, we have our uh, two uh, CEQA leads, um, project director, Rich Walter, and product, project manager, Leo Mena. Next slide. I'm gonna now go into a little project background. If you can continue to the next slide, thank you. 
This figure shows you our, our ACE rail line that as it exists today from Stockton to San Jose, we've been running ACE service for more than two decades now. ACE does run on UP track for most of the alignment from Stockton all the way down to Santa Clara. We do use Caltrain track from Santa Clara to, to San Jose. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we were running four daily round trips during the weekdays. Uh, we really focus on, on, on commuter service where our four round trips leave uh, very early in the morning from Stockton and go all the way down to San Jose, stay there for, for the day and then come back in the late afternoon, early evening, bringing uh, workers back from their jobs um, to their homes. Uh, our main market, number one market, is from the Northern San Joaquin Valley to the Silicon Valley. Um, our second largest market is from the Tri-Valley area, Pleasanton, Livermore, Dublin, to the Silicon Valley. And then we also have another strong market from the Northern San Joaquin Valley to the Tri-Valley area. Next slide. During the, uh, this pandemic, we, our, our ridership has suffered greatly, like all public transportation during this pandemic in this state and in the country, and, is, and then particularly rail services. Uh, we did have to reduce our service uh, down to two daily round trips for most of this pandemic. More recently, the good news is we did bring back the third daily round trip on May 3rd, and we are looking forward to the state reopening in the next month or so, and uh, Silicon Valley welcoming workers back to their office at least a couple few days a week. And so we're hopeful to be able to bring back the fourth daily round trip by the end of this year. Next slide. This figure shows you our Valley Rail Program, which is a joint program between the Rail Commission and the San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority. The San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority is the managing agency for the uh, San Joaquin service, a different rail service. Uh, the two services have worked together on this, this program where we are going to extend ACE to Sacramento and also extend ACE down to Merced and we are going to expand the San Joaquin service to, to, to Sacramento as part of this Valley Rail program. Over the last four years, we've secured about $1.3 billion for Valley Rail. Next slide. The environmental work between uh, Lathrop and Ceres for ACE extension has already been completed. We're nearing the completion of the final design for that and looking to start construction later this year on that section of the, of the alignment. From Stockton to, to uh, Sacramento, to Thomas, we have completed the environmental with the exception of the uh, Elk Grove Station, and we're gonna have to come back and do separate a document for the Elk Grove Station, but otherwise we've completed environmental, and we are starting the, the, the final design for that section as well. We're really here tonight to, to really just to talk about and share the work for the uh, section from Ceres to Merced, where we've recently re released the draft document. And as this figure shows, uh, for that section, the draft really identifies the three proposed stations at Turlock, Livingston, and Merced. Next slide. And at this uh, point, I'm gonna turn over the presentation to our ACOM project manager, Daniel Krause. Great, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I'm gonna start off with just a general high level overview of the project and then I'll hand it off to uh, Daniel Hartman to go into the specifics and details of the various components of the project. I wanted to start by talking about that the work we're doing for this part of for this environmental process is built on previous work that was begun uh, previously in a different environmental process. So back in 2018 the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission completed an EIR for the ACE extension from Lathrop to Ceres and to Merced. And this project envisioned a two-phase extension of ACE service from Lathrop to Merced, uh, with the first phase being from Lathrop to Ceres. Now that uh, first phase was analyzed at a project level of detail in that environmental document, which means that it's fully environmentally cleared and um, can proceed to the next phases of project development, which include um, you know, final design and construction. Phase two of the extension of ACE um, from Ceres to Merced was analyzed in that same environmental document, but at a programmatic level of detail, which means that some of the environmental analysis was, was conducted, but there still needs to be some more to finish off to fully clear the, um, that portion of the extension. Um, so it's fully clear so you can move on to the next phase of project development. So this project is now conducting an EIR at the project level of detail for that ACE um, for the series Merced extension so we can fully 
clear this particular part of the extension. Next slide, please. So we kicked off this uh, environmental process back in on May 28th with the release of the notice of preparation. Now this document included um, a project description and the overall scope and components of the project. And also at the same time when that document was released, the scoping comment period was, was initiated and that comment period lasted from May 28th, 2020 to July 7th, 2020. As part of the scoping comment period, uh, we also held three virtual scoping meetings uh, in late June of 2020, two on June 25th and one on June 30th. Next slide, please. This is the project location map. I'd like to start with a little context. In the lower left, you can see an inset map and there's a yellow line there. That's the current ACE system that Dan Levitt described earlier, which is a single line system that runs from Stockton to San Jose. The larger map shows the extension, the two phases of the series of uh, extension of ACE from Lathrop to Merced with the first, uh, you can see the first phase in the dashed green line. And you can see that that uh, extension ties into the existing ACE service at a new station in North Lathrop. And other new stations as part of that first phase of the extension include stations in downtown Manteca, Ripon, Modesto, and Ceres. The purple line indicates that second phase of extension from Ceres to Merced. Um, this proposed project in the draft environmental document includes three stations, Turlock, Livingston, and Merced. This figure also shows an Atwater station since it was investigated as an alternative to the Livingston station throughout the environmental document. In addition to the stations, there's a Merced layover facility in the city of Merced just north of the proposed Merced station. Also wanted to mention all along the corridor between Ceres and Merced there will be track improvements to allow uh, to increase capacity of that corridor to allow for passenger rail service to be initiated there. Currently it's a freight rail corridor owned by Union Pacific. So to allow for passenger trains to share the, the corridor, there needs to be additional track work. Next slide, please. So with the full completion and implementation of this extension to Merced, along with the other extension from Stockton to Sacramento that Dan Levitt mentioned earlier, there's going to be a new operating scenario for ACE. It will be an additional branch of service. So I wanted to kind of go through that. I'm going to start with Merced. There will be four daily round trips to and from Merced. Of the four, one will run direct to San Jose, which you can see is uh, indicated by the red line. The other three of those four daily round trips are shown in the green line, and those will run from Merced to the Natoma Sacramento station via Sacramento area. Now I want to point out there will be a transfer hub at the North Lathrop station, which will allow passengers that come from Merced to or, or to the south to um, get off at North Lathrop station and then cross the platform and take a time transfer of trains running southbound to San Jose. So if you can't take the direct train to San Jose from Merced, you can take uh, you can transfer very efficiently at this hub station, which will allow you to use any one of the four stations to get to Silicon Valley and San Jose. Um, also, the current service from Stockton to San Jose will be maintained with two daily round trips, uh, as shown in the dark blue line. And then also the, the light blue line, there'll be one uh, daily round trip from the Thomas to Sacramento Airport all the way to San Jose direct. And then finally, there'll be a daily round trip between the Thomas Sacramento Airport Station and Stockton. Next slide, please. Just wanted to kind of review some of the key benefits of the project. Um, the, the first um, is kind of the primary one. We're gonna be, the project enhances commuter and intercity passenger rail, and also increases transit connectivity in the San Joaquin Valley. In addition, the passenger, passenger rail service will be serving areas that currently have no service or very limited service. Uh, the project also supports transit-oriented development near the proposed station locations. The project also provides an opportunity to connect the ACE system with the future high-speed rail system in the Merced. Also, by implementing this project, there'll be alternatives to automobile use, which will help alleviate traffic on congested roads and highways in the region. And due to these these um, increases, excuse me, the, there will also be an increase in air quality due to the 
less traffic from the project, and that'll also lead to a reduction in greenhouse gases. Additionally, because of those factors, there will be long-term health benefits for ACE riders and residents and employees along the ACE corridor. And finally, the project promotes local and regional land use and transportation planning goals and initiatives. Now I want to pass the presentation to Daniel Hartman, and he will go over the specifics of the project elements. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Next slide. First, I'd like to begin and talk about the track improvements as part of the project. In this slide at the top of the graphic, you can see the existing scenario where UP mainly has a single track corridor down the Fresno subdivision. It, it includes passing sidings at uh, various locations where northbound and southbound trains can pass each other. Our previous in EIR, the program level document, uh, cleared an ACE track on the east side of the main line down the entire stretch. The difference with this document is after coordination with UPRR, we've changed the assumptions where instead of building a new track the whole day, we're going to be upgrading some of the sidings and connecting those sidings uh, with new track in order to uh, essentially make a double track corridor. Next slide. The first station starting at the north and going south is the Turlock station as shown here in the graphic. The station includes a center loaded platform as shown in blue. It has uh, two mainline tracks that go on each side of it. Access to the platform will be via grade crossing to the north and a pedestrian bridge towards the middle of the platform that will be accessed via stairs and elevators. Uh, going across, there'll be another access point um, kind of on the island between Golden State Boulevard and North Front Street. Um, and then another access point over at the existing transit center. Transit access for the station will come from the buses at the existing transit center. And the parking will be supplied by a combination of some of the parking spaces within the transit center and then building diagonal spaces along the west side of North Front Street. This accommodates all of the surface parking needed for the project. Next slide. This is a visual simulation uh, where the top view is, is a picture from the uh, intersection to the north, Fulkerth, uh, Hawkeye, and Golden State Boulevard, looking south. The bottom picture is the simulation where in the right side of the picture, you can see the platform and in particular, the access structures, the stairs going up and the elevators, uh, all going to a pedestrian bridge that crosses over. Um, in the uh, island there, you can see the uh, elevator core of the access structure that drops people down onto the island. And then continuing across the pedestrian bridge, the access structure over on the transit center side. Next slide. The next station is in Livingston. It is just south of Main Street. It is also a center platform uh, as shown in blue with the two main lines going on each side. Access at this location will also have a accurate access on the north side over to a crossing at Main Street. And on the south end, a pedestrian tunnel accessed via ramps and stairs, which go down to the tunnel and then over in the parking area, ramps and stairs back up. Uh, the parking area shown in green and then uh, bus stops on the entrance area in gray coming in off of Main Street and then circling back around uh, once passengers are picked up and dropped off. Next slide. 
This is the photo simulation of the Livingston Station. The existing condition at the top, you can see there's the building right along the street. And then on the bottom, you can see that that entrance area has a bus in the bus stop. Behind that, you can see the center platform and the shelters with the uh, light fixture sticking up. And then you can also see the trees and the plantings within the parking area. Next slide. The Merced station is a single side platform station, uh, which means that you have <clears throat> only loading on one side. The loading will come from a station track just to the west side of the main line. That allows for the train to stop and uh, wait in the morning to pick up the passengers and not interrupt the flow of freight traffic on the main line. Um, as you can see, this, the platform side platform is shown in blue. Access to that platform shown in orange is at grade access off of the back side towards the parking area. And then also south off the end of the platform towards O Street where passengers can cross over and go to the uh, transit center in Merced uh, along O and 16th Street. The parking uh, area shown in green. And uh, that's it for that station. So let's go to the photo simulation on the next slide. Again, the top view is from the north end of the station looking south. You can see in the existing photo, there are a few buildings that our um, parking needs to uh, take. And then in the simulation below, you can see the platform and the lighting, the parking area and the landscaping associated with that. And then the other thing that I wanted to show you on this slide was the fence that goes between the station track and the mainline track. That fence is a safety fence, which makes sure that passengers come all the way to the street, R Street on the north and O Street on the south, um, before crossing over uh, in a safe pedestrian crossing. Next slide. This is the Merced layover and maintenance facility. It is in North Merced, just north of Highway 59. Access to the station will be via the purple spur track, the existing spur track that serves this industrial area. Um, in the light uh, purple or pink area, that's the storage area for the trains, the uh, tracks where they'll overlay at night. Um, the light blue, box is the maintenance building with the darker blue being the uh, offices. The green is the parking area. And then there's a little yellow box that is the uh, train wash. Next slide. The photo simulation here is from Highway 59. Looking across the spur line track, um, you can see the on the bottom view, the south end of the maintenance building. Next slide. This slide is an example of the uh, ACES Stockton maintenance facility. Um, the top view is, is the um, view from above and the entrance, and then a couple of uh, pictures from the middle of what the facility looks like on the outside. And then the bottom pictures is how the facility is uh, kept up clean. This picture is not from right when it opens. Um, nice, clean, shiny floors. It actually has been operating for a while. This is how they, um, they, they keep the facility operating very uh, clean and efficiently. Next slide. Now, as Daniel talked before, we do have the Atwater Station alternative 
and uh, Rich Walter will talk about the differences between the project stations and the alternative. Um, this all, the Atwater station is just south of uh, Applegate Road along Atwater Boulevard. It is also a center loaded platform with the two uh, mainline tracks on each side. It also has at grade access to the north uh, up to the pedestrian crossing at Applegate Road and to the south via the tunnel, also with the ramps and stairways coming down, taking you underneath the track and then stairs and ramps back up to the plaza area shown in orange. Um, the transit for this station will be via on-street bus stops and the parking here is shown in green is three distinct areas uh, along Atwater Boulevard, north of the plaza area, south of the plaza area, and then across the street in a lot um, on Atwater. Next slide. This is the photo simulation. Is also from the north looking south uh, in the median of Atwater Boulevard. As you can see, there are many businesses and buildings along this area that will need to be taken out to support the station. Down at the bottom, you can see the platform, the shelters and the lighting on the platform. You can also see the parking and the landscape buffer in front. The walkway on the other side of the cars uh, are separated from the track by a, a safety fence, <clears throat> taking people down to the access point to the south or to the north. Next slide. Now I'd like to hand it off to Rich Walter. I'm gonna go over uh, some of the uh, results of the environmental impact report that's been released for review and describe the process going forward from this point. Next slide, please. So under the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, we're required to assess a broad range of different resources. Uh, they're all listed on this page. Uh, they range from agricultural resources, farmland, air quality, uh, noise and vibration, impacts on biological resources, and so on. And we have separate de dedicated sections of the environmental impact report, which is up on the commission's website. Uh, there's separate files for each of these, or there's one big file that you can download uh, depending on your preference uh, in, in terms of how you wanna access the document. In addition to all these individual resources uh, that are assessed, we also look at cumulative impacts, taking into account uh, expected other projects that are in the works in the project area. Next slide, please. Based on the analysis in the draft EIR, uh, we identify some beneficial impacts. These are all related to uh, diverting people from individual passenger cars into uh, train travel instead, and that results in a reduction in the vehicle miles traveled by on-road passenger vehicles. And as a result of that, um, we also have benefits in terms of regional air quality. So overall reduction of things like ozone precursors or um, uh, particulate matter, um, as well as savings overall in energy consumption and reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, including carbon dioxide. We also find some impacts that are less than significant before we consider any mitigation. So um, operational noise of the uh, noise effect of the trains um, and our operations of our maintenance facility, as well as on population and housing and public services. Next slide, please. We have some areas where we have significant impacts before we consider mitigation, but using uh, fairly standard mitigation for linear projects or rail projects, uh, we found a way to mitigate all the impacts that you see on the screen, which is most of the impacts of the project can be reduced um, readily to a less than significant level. Next slide, please. We do have some impacts that are called significant and unavoidable impacts, where uh, although we may have mitigation, we may not reduce them all the way to below a, a significant um, threshold. Uh, the first one is about the conversion of in, uh, important farmland. So important farmland is an overall term that refers to uh, uh, higher quality um, farmland that's of greater concern than uh, 
just average uh, grazing land, for example. And that includes prime farmland, which is the highest category of concern, which would be irrigated high value crops um, in general. Uh, we have some impacts within the existing railroad right-of-way. This is somewhat of an anomalous situation where in certain areas, agricultural uh, farming has actually occurred inside the right-of-way um, that we would um, have some conversion of those even though they should be used for railroad purposes. Um, we also have about 11 acres at the Merced layover and maintenance facility. Uh, this is farmland designated as farmland of local importance. Uh, it's located within an industrial park area adjacent to long-standing uh, business park uses. Uh, it's designated for industrial use. Um, in review of aerial photography uh, going back a number of years, uh, we didn't identify that this area has been uh, irrigated, but has been primarily been used for hay, uh, which is a relatively low value crop. Next slide, please. We do have mitigation uh, for this, which is uh, pretty standard mitigation, which is first for uh, areas that we disturb temporarily, we would avoid them as much as possible. And if we do disturb them, we'll restore them after we complete construction, including uh, you know, ripping of the areas that might've been compacted by heavy construction equipment so that they'll be ready for renewed uh, farming use. And then also for any permanent uh, areas of conversion, we would uh, conserve other important farmland um, by placing uh, conservation easements on that land to ensure that it stays in agricultural use. Um, previously, uh, it was fairly common in CEQA that you would find that with this type of mitigation, you would have a less than significant impact, but there was a very important court ruling from last year that said uh, the use of conservation easements alone did not necessarily reduce an impact to less than significant. So we're following that court uh, direction to uh, make this disclosure. Uh, that court ruling had nothing to do with this project. It was in, in general a CEQA ruling for a, a very different project. Next slide, please. Uh, the other significant unavoidable we have is for construction noise. Uh, this is not at all time in all locations. Uh, it's a temporary impact in certain locations uh, that we would uh, exceed the thresholds. Uh, it would be limited to residences that are located within about 135 to 270 feet from the specific construction site. For track work, which is our definitely our most lengthy um, activity that would affect most people, we're looking at few, a few days to a week in any uh, one location, so it moves pretty quickly. Around the stations, uh, it's longer, 10 to 14 months, and around the Merced layover and maintenance facility, it's about 24 months. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean that all that all that time is gonna be above that threshold. We only exceed the threshold when we use particularly um, noisy equipment. So it's not just your average equipment, but you know, some of your uh, larger pieces of equipment, uh, you know, if you were doing any pile driving, uh, that's a particularly noisy activity, uh, saw cutting, um, those kind of things, concrete saws. So it's, it's some very specific, not every piece of equipment. And again, only those areas where you'd be back within um, 270 feet of that specific, particularly loud equipment. So yes, there would be some impacts um, that are unavoidable, but, um, but it would be more discreet. Uh, we do have mitigation that includes implementing a noise control plan, uh, which includes uh, equipment controls, timing controls, uh, and uh, other measures to try and reduce those as much as we can. Next slide, please. CEQA requires the consideration of alternatives, and we've considered a wide range um, of alternatives. And uh, in Chapter 5 of the EIR, you can read all the alternatives that were considered, including um, stations and alignments and technologies and other things. Um, we did a screening uh, process where we looked at all the possible alternatives and uh, whether they met the projects, uh, most of the project's objectives. Uh, if they did not, they were screened out. Uh, whether they were feasible, if they were not feasible, they were screened out. And if they lowered, if they were both of those first two things, if they lowered uh, one or more significant impacts of the proposed project, again, if they did not, then they were screened out. Um, so we have four alternatives that we ended up um, actually evaluating in the EIR. Um, and they're listed here, and I'm going to go through each one of them in turn. Next slide. So the no project alternative is just what it sounds like. It's, it's the effect of not doing the project. 
Um, this is a required analysis under CEQA. Um, very simply put, if we do not construct the project, we won't have construction impacts. If we don't operate the project, we won't have the operational impacts, but we also won't have the operational benefits of the project. Uh, again, those are air quality, greenhouse gas, energy, vehicle miles traveled reduce, and support for TOD, which is transit-oriented development. Next slide, please. We also have the Atwater Station alternative, and uh, we have analyzed the Atwater Station alternative at the same level of detail as the proposed project. So CEQA requires that you uh, propose a specific project in your EIR. And at this time, we've proposed the Livingston um, Station as part of the proposed project. But CEQA also allows that if you have fully analyzed an alternative, you, the commission in this case as the lead agency, can select um, an alternative at the end of the process after the, the EIA, certification of the final EIR. So while there's a proposed project, there's no prohibition on selecting an alternative provided it, is, it has been analyzed and disclosed. And those decisions won't be made right now. So the identification of the proposed project at this time does not mean an alternative might not be selected. Maybe it does. That's something that is up to the commission at the end of the process. Uh, Daniel Hartman described the uh, features of the Atwater Station alternative. Next slide. And here are some uh, comparison of the Atwater Station to the Livington Station, which is proposed. Uh, environmentally, we really didn't find any substantial differences between them. There's some minor differences, but nothing that really stood out in terms uh, that would make you say that one is, was environmentally um, superior to the other. The uh, parking accessibility to Livington Station is all one contiguous lot. Uh, the Atwater Station, uh, about one third of the spaces are across the boulevard, so you'd have to cross the street. Uh, Livingston, we need one parcel. Atwater Station, the property is a little bit more uh, divided up into different parcels, about 10 parcels acquisition. Demolition for Livingston is one building and Atwater before. Um, station spacing, the Livingston Station is more evenly, allows for more even spacing of stations, uh, about 14 miles from Merced to Livingston, about 11 miles further to get to Turlock, whereas Atwater Station would be about seven miles between Merced and Atwater. And the closer the stations are together, um, sometimes that is more challenging to manage the freight uh, during, you know, during the morning hours for say, when you might have multiple trains moving through. If they're more evenly spaced out, it's much easier to manage uh, to minimize um, time delays that might happen to freight or passenger by getting uh, the trains through there. So um, that's a little bit different between the two um, options. And then the cost, the Livingston Station uh, preliminary cost is estimated about $6 million um, less than the Atwater Station. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, my screen faded out there for a sec. Um, Merced, uh, we have analyzed the station alternative here at a lesser level of detail than the proposed project. Uh, this was the station option that was identified in the prior programmatic EIR. Um, that was done. So it's further south. It's about a half mile or so um, south of the proposed location, uh, kind of in more in the southern part of downtown Merced, if you will, instead of the northern part of downtown Merced. Um, and this location would be adjacent to the currently proposed high-speed rail uh, Merced station that has been um, cleared in their environmental document. Uh, the city of Merced, uh, we've had a lot of contact with them and discussions. They prefer that both the ACE station and the high-speed rail station actually be located at a more northerly uh, location in Merced than in the southerly location, uh, more near the Merced transit station. And that's where ACE currently is proposing to put its station. Um, and then the city is hoping that high-speed rail would also uh, move their station to that northerly location. But at this point, the, the California High-Speed Rail Authority has cleared the southerly location, so we'll see. Next slide, please. So our analysis in the EIR is that our proposed uh, ACE Merced station it has greater consistency with the city's uh, long-term planning uh, because it has a greater potential for transit-oriented development. The southerly location is more developed and, and uh, so a little more disruptive to be there. 
but uh, and and doesn't have as much uh, potential for new t new TOD growth. Um, at the Merced station for construction, there are some residences relatively nearby across the street, so there might be some more impacts there during construction at the at the alternative location. Uh, the residences are a little bit further away. Um, for ACE, uh, the Northerly station is a half mile less track work, so it's less construction emissions. Uh, for the alternative, it'd be a half mile more. And then air quality and greenhouse gas emissions for operations, this one is kind of, it really depends. So um, at, if the two, the high, the A station and the high-speed rail station are a half mile apart, uh, there'll be less benefit. There might be some people who that would be discouraging from a ridership point of view if they were transferring between them. Uh, you could walk a half mile. There's also likely, if that situation would come by, there's likely to be some kind of small shuttle that would help people. Um, to get between the two um, that could operate as well. But still not having a ride on the platform, you're likely to have a little bit less uh, ridership and, and as a result, a little bit less benefits for reducing BMT and, and emissions. So uh, if the High-Speed Rail Authority decides to keep their station where it is currently approved, then the alternative would have slightly better BMT and slightly lower emissions. If they were to decide it, the city's request or for their own reasons to move it to this more northerly location than the proposed location that ACE has in the EIR would have less emissions. Next slide. And finally, we also have a, a layover facility alternative, um, also in Merced, uh, kind of the north side, but on the northwest side, instead of the northeast side, it would be west of State Route 99. Uh, in some uh, current agricultural areas as shown on the slide. Next slide, please. And a comparison of impacts there. The first one is farmland. So the alternative location is in, a, in an acre of prime farmland, which is the highest quality uh, land, and there's a larger amount of it uh, compared to the proposed facility, which has some farmland of local importance um, that has mostly been used for hay, which is lower value crop. So greater impacts on the alternative on that one. For land use planning, the proposed location is in an industrial area designated for industrial use. The alternative is in an agricultural area designated for agricultural use. So uh, aesthetics, the proposed facility is located adjacent to other light industri in industrial uses, so it's very compatible with it. Uh, the alternative is in a farm, it's in a field, uh, um, so it's more of an open space and agricultural character. And then noise, we do have a few more um, people located near the uh, proposed location because uh, it's more clo it's closer to town. Uh, that's uh, more, not a concern during operations, but a concern in construction. There might be some people affected by uh, some construction that's really close to them at that time. Uh, the layover facility, the residences are a lot further away, so it'd be lower there for construction. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our process, which, as Daniel Krauss articulated, started in May of 2020 uh, with our notice of preparation and scoping at that time. Uh, we released the EIR um, in this last month, and we're going through the public meetings presently. Um, our goal is to publish the final EIR in fall that would include contain um, responses to all of the substantive comments received on the EIR, as well as any necessary revisions to that, and then followed by certification of that EIR and approval of the project. And if that happens as, as scheduled, then we would go into design and construction in 2022 to 2024, uh, with a goal for anticipated uh, start of a service to Merced, perhaps as soon as 2025. Next slide, please. Our comment period runs through June 7th at 5 p.m. And we request if you have comments to submit them in writing uh, by, by regular mail, via email, or on the web page. there's a submission form uh, on that page that you can just click on and submit your uh, comments directly. Any of those three are fine. Um, tonight, uh, we're focused on uh, responding to your questions about the project, what is it, uh, where is it, where the facilities, understanding it, that in detail, or about the EIR, what analysis is in there, where can I find X, where can I find Y, 
And um, if you make comments tonight uh, about the document itself, its adequacy or anything, we wouldn't be responding tonight, but we, we certainly encourage you to put those in writing and then we'll respond in writing in the final EIR. And that's so we can have all our full team because these environmental analyses take a really big team of experts and we really want to get the best um, answers possible that we can provide at that time. Uh, so that's why we're requiring comments to come in writing and that's why we'll respond in depth in writing.